So I want to talk about the art of loving. The art of loving. If, if you would turn with me, turn to John chapter 13 and verse 34. John chapter 13 and verse 34. I want to read this expanded uh, Bible version. Jesus said to his disciples, to you and to me, to those who, who, who count themselves as his followers, he said this, I give you a new command. Okay, he's giving us something new to think about. All right, love each other. Love each other. You must love each other or love one another as I have loved you. Okay, that's the qualification. You, we are to love each other as Christ has loved us. All people will know that you are my disciples, that you are my followers, if you love each other. You know, that's quite the statement. And it's quite the challenge for the church of God and for anybody who calls himself a Christian. You know, that the world will know us, that we are his followers, that we are the disciples of Jesus Christ if you love each other. You know, I mentioned, of course, you know, that this is the anniversary, the 75th anniversary of Kristallnacht. It's interesting because in, in, in preparing this sermon, I, I, I did some research on um, Arthur Frome who in the 20th century was a renowned psychologist and social philosopher uh, who wrote a book in 1956 called The Art of Loving, which is the title of my sermon, The Art of Loving. Frome was born and grew up in Germany. And the interesting thing is he grew up, he was Jewish. He is his, in his family, he was a descendant of a long line of rabbis. He grew up studying the Torah. He studied the Talmud and a few of these things. But in the mid twenties, because he was into psychology, he was, you know, he was, uh, he was into Freudism at that point in time and doing stuff like this. He became quite secular. You know, he stopped. I guess he stopped to really. Uh, his parents were Orthodox Jews, but he stopped being um, a religious person. But he was wise enough to realize that after the Nazis came to power in 1934, he hightailed it. He got out of there. So he, so you know, he wrote some of these books that were that we know. And this book that he wrote in 1956, *The Art of Loving*, is probably the best known of his works. I mean, he wrote a number of a variety of things. And whenever you read one of these things, there's there's some interesting points to take from. But Eric Fromm asks this question. He says, "Is love an art?" Is love an art? It says, well, if it is an art, then it requires knowledge and effort. One person writing a book review on, uh, on Frome's book uh, a number of years ago he said this. He said, they, they pointed out that, he, yeah, he has some logic in this because no one can become a master at anything overnight. If love is an art, it requires knowledge and effort. It, you, we can't become a master of anything overnight. If you're playing an instrument, a piano, there are literally thousands and thousands of all hours you must devote and discipline yourself to practice and to study to learn to be able to play that instrument. And it's true whatever you want. If you want, if you're, uh, if you want to be a cabinet maker, if you want to work in wood or metal or anything else, it is going to take thousands of hours that you have to devote to it before you really know the subject. If you go into school, it takes hours to learn something before you master a subject. One of the big problems we have in our public schools these days is the kids don't put in the work. They po don't put in the discipline and pay attention, and they're not mastering the subject. They're not learning the things they ought to. It says that if a person, even if a person carries within himself or herself the promised and talent of a master, okay, we have the potential of being a master, okay, we've got the brains, we've got the smarts, we've got the background, we've got the whatever, we have all that, he must still persevere through many thousands of hours of learning and practice to demonstrate the skill, to acquire mastery, 
because it's only after mastery will that person find playing that instrument or doing that task or you know working in that field can they can will they will it seem to be really satisfying and even easy it's like looking at a, 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 a guitarist a master guitarist and he gets up there and he just plays or a, pia a pianist you know and they just play and it's just remarkable but that doesn't come out of the thin blue air it doesn't it takes it takes discipline it takes practice you have to hone and work at it well is art you know is love an art well it is and when we think of it from that standpoint to acquire mastery in love takes a lot of knowledge takes a lot of effort takes a lot of practice who is after all the master of love okay that's an easy one right <laughs> 10 points for everybody who is the master of love well what's the scripture it says god is love in first john in chapter 4 it's repeated two times in first john that chapter god is love he is love he is the master of love. And it's deeply satisfying for him to practice it, to be it. It is a state of being for him. He is love. And the Greek word here you know, that's, uh, that the Apostle John used uh, when he wrote his epistle there in 1 John chapter 4, when he said, God is love, it's agape. Okay, we know that word. It's properly love which centers in moral preference. Well, I've talked about this before. It, dip, it refers, you know, agape is divine love. It's what God prefers. See, that's what love is. It's what God prefers. Human beings want to reinterpret love to be an emotion and our sentiment, but that's not what love is. It's not. Love is, it's, 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 it's all centered on moral preferences, on God's moral preferences. That's what real love is. If it's not, if it's not centered on what God chooses, you know, what is preferable in God's perspective, then it's not love. That's a hard thing to think about because a lot of people miss that. They think they can just hop, you know, that they can ignore everything God has to say and that they can you say, well, I'm living by love because they live by what their personal sentiment is, their emotion is. But that's not what it is. That's not love at all because that sort of love disappears. It disappears. It doesn't last. It doesn't endure. You know, Frome asked in his book, who will tell? Whether one happy moment of love, okay, talking about the preciousness, the value of love, if one moment of love or the joy of breathing or walking on a bright morning and smelling the fresh air is not worth all the suffering and effort which life implies. You know, that's a remarkable thing to think about. One moment of love. One moment of really being able to be in that state, is it, you know, does that validate everything else that goes on in life? We know, you know, that those who love much will also do a certain amount of suffering. That's just the way it works. You know, but it's, it's that moment of love, it validates, it is the purpose and the reason for existence. Very few people want to live without love in their life. Let's go to Hebrews 12 and verse 2. Hebrews 12 and verse 2, I'm going to read this in the Amplified. You're talking about this one moment of love, validating everything else, all the other mess that life can throw at you. Well, that's the, that's, that's the, that's the picture that the Bible presents to us about Jesus of Nazareth and what God the Father himself had to go through and what, and what they were willing to do for that moment of love, supreme act of love. In Hebrews 2, 12, it says, looking away from what will distract to Jesus, Jesus, who is the leader and the source of our faith, giving the first incentive to our belief. That's what it means. He's the one who gives the incentive to, to why we believe and is also the finisher. Okay, he's the, Jesus is the finisher of our state. He initiates it. He, he, he's the one that brings it into us in the first place. And then he's the finisher. That means he brings it to maturity and 
perfection. You see, we're looking unto Jesus who creates it, our faith in us, and who finishes, who brings it to maturity and perfection. It doesn't happen all at once. It takes a long time to acquire this mastery. He, for the joy of obtaining the prize that was set before him, endured the cross, despising and ignoring the shame, uh, you know, because being crucified as in the way, in the means of a common criminal, you know, being stripped naked and all those things, it, he was willing to do all that. And he, he, cause he's now seated at the right hand of the throne of God. He was willing to do that because he was looking, he, he looked before him and saw what was going to be accomplished. It was something that he did because he loved us. Let's go to John 3, 16. This is the classic scripture. I'll read this in Coulter. John 3, 16. For God so loved, or in this way loved, and here you have the, the verb agapao, which is a verb form of agape, with agape being the noun. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, so that everyone who believes, that is to say, everyone who continually believes, because that's what the verb tense here is saying, who continually believes in him may not perish, but have everlasting life. You know, this point here, everyone who believes, I just want to make a point here. This belief is a continuous, deep, lifelong inner conviction of faith accompanied by loving obedience to God the Father and Jesus Christ. It is not a mere mental or verbal acknowledgement of Jesus Christ. Everyone who believes, see there's a lot that's carried in that word. It really means, you know, is, to really believe is to engage in this mastery process, is to become a disciple, to be studying for our course of our life. Now, when, when it says, you know, that, that uh, God so loved the world, okay, you know, God so loved the world, where it's talking to Agapao, you know, agapao, again, is this, you know, it is this love that's always defined by God. It's, it's love that's defined. It's that discriminating affection, and it always involves choice and selection. That's it, because it's embracing God's will. God so loved the world. He, it's a choice of selection, it, you know, and when we love, if we're going to really love, we are embracing God's will in our life. We're making, we're choosing what he chooses. We're obeying him, of course, through the power that he presents to his people by his spirit. That's what it means. That's what it means for us to love God. Now, Eric Fromm thought, you know, he looked at love as a skill that can be taught and developed. He very much did not look at love as an emotion and as a feeling. He felt this is one of the major pitfalls of our modern society, is that we think of love as this feeling, as this emotion, and that's not what it is, Fromm was saying, and he's right from that standpoint. He believes that love, you know, he, the way he puts it, he does not believe that love is a noun or an object. Okay? Love is not a noun or an object. He says, but he says, but it's a verb. It's, it's a practice. Love is a practice. It's a verb. It is doing. It's not a feeling. Love, in another way, another a commentator uh, looking at uh, Fromm's work, one of the reviewers said, love is a skill set that human beings develop and use through their own will. That's how this particular reviewer looked at it. Because, of course, you know, Fromm was writing from a secular point of view. But he says it's, it's this, it's this skill set that we deliver. It's not a prize by gaining someone else's affection and trust. You know, that's quite different. That turns it on the head. 
You know, Fromm did not believe in falling in love. He did, you, were in a, you, you, you were practicing love. You were in love. Learning about and practicing love, Fromm says, ought to stand at the center of our lives. And he's right. Because what is there to life? What is a greater reason for us existence but to, to exist but to learn about love? It's not falling in love. It's learning about love. It's being love. It's practicing love. This is the skill set that Fromm was looking at and in his book, The Art of Loving. This is what he was talking about, that, that we develop. And there is something to be said about that. Let's go to Galatians 5. Galatians 5 and verse 13. Galatians 5 and verse 13. Because we, love is a practice. It's a practice. It's something we must do. It's something we, 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 we must live. Okay? It's not just feeling. It's not just tingling we get. You know, I looked at her and I felt <laughs> love. You know, that's not it. <laughs> that's something different. That's a different Greek word. Okay? <laughs> that's, that's a totally deep, different Greek word. Anyways, Galatians 5.13 Apostle Paul said this to the church brethren. He said, my brothers and sisters, God has called you to be free, but do not use your freedom as an excuse to do what pleases your sinful self. And of course, this is what many people, they do just the opposite of what Paul said, okay? They use their, you know, what they call their Christian freedom as an, uh, as an opportunity or an occasion to do sin, which is totally opposite to what Paul is saying, because sin is a transgression of the law, and a lot of people who, who you know, read the Bible do the opposite of what Paul is saying. He says, you're called to be free, but do not use your freedom as an excuse to do you know, what pleases your sinful self. And then your sinful self is our sinful nature. It is the carnal nature that is our native resident state. That's what we are without the Spirit of God. But we're not to, we're not to use this freedom that, that we've been given in Christ to do whatever pleases our sinful self. But instead, what are we supposed to do? Look what Paul says. But rather, serve each other with love. Serve each other with love. The whole law is made complete. That means to say it's summed up. It's again fulfilled. You know, it's, it's just fully accomplished, stretching it out and reaching its full attainment. Okay, love, yeah, from this aspect, the whole law is complete. It's summed up, it's fulfilled in this word. One command, love your neighbor as yourself. Love your neighbor as yourself. Of course, from this aspect, Paul was quoting Leviticus 19.18, okay? The Old Testament, okay? Whoa. <laughs> you know, the, the, the Hebrew Bible, which was inspired by, by Jesus. <laughs> you know, that's a, that's a hard one for many people to say, but I don't get tired of it saying Jesus was the God of the Old Covenant. He's the one that stood on top of Mount Sinai. He's the one that said to Moses and said, write this one down, Moses. You get it right. Love your neighbor as you love yourself. Okay? That was a, that's something he's been trying to work on for a long, long time. Love your neighbor as you love yourself. But humanity has had a terrible problem about doing this from antiquity up to 75 years ago with the Nazis storming through the street. <laughs> Were they loving their neighbors? They loved them. Not even close. <laughs> it was just the opposite. But he's saying to us, we must do this. If we're going to call ourselves Christians, we must love our neighbor as you love yourself. And then he makes this point, Paul, the Apostle Paul, in verse 15. But if you go on hurting each other, Okay, this is the expanded version. If you go on hurting each other and tearing each other apart, you know, the lexicon, you know, biting and devouring each other, you know, like these animals in a cage, you know, like rats in a cage, biting and devouring, you know, each other. No, that's not it. But if you do go on hurting each other and tearing each other apart, be careful 
or you will be completely destroyed or consumed by each other. You know, this is something we have to take seriously. We are to love our neighbor as we love ourselves. We can't just go around, hurt, you know, say, well, that's his problem, that's her problem, let it, deal with it, deal with it, <laughs> yeah, you know, from this standpoint. No, that's not it, is it? We can't do that. We can't go around, you know, hurting each other and tearing each other apart, the Apostle Paul says. Otherwise, we could end up completely destroying, consuming each other. Even Fromm observes that real love, you know, he says it's not a sentiment which can be easily indulged by anyone. It's not a sentiment. Okay, it's just not a feeling. It's sometimes some of the things we do. It's what we practice, how we deal on a daily basis with each other. He suggests that it's only through developing totally your personality, from the total development of your personality, to a capacity of loving one's neighbor with true humility, courage, faith, and discipline. Okay, this was a secular guy who's writing this. That you can only, you know, we can only love if we're developing ourselves and our, uh, our capacity to love a, a neighbor with true humility, courage, faith, and discipline. By doing this, then one begins to have the opportunity to attain and experience real love. It's in doing these things, in, then we experience real love. Then we experience it. Then we attain it. The Bible, of course, knew something that Eric Fromm never fully realized. He understood some things because he had a real background you know, for the first 26 years of, years of his life because I'm sure his parents had drilled it into him all the time in, in the environment he lived in when he was an Orthodox Jew, he, you know, he, he knew that the Bible was talking about them. He, he knew that statement, you must love your enemies as yourself. The Bible reveals, you know, very much uh, in the New Covenant Scriptures that it's not within ourselves that we have to look, okay, for this strength to follow this way of love. No, there's something else. We don't look within ourselves. We have to, in this aspect, look without. If we go to Galatians 5.22, I want to read this to you. Of course, this is famous. I did a whole series on this, and I'm not going, I just want to read this one scripture, but to make the point here. But in Galatians 5.22, it starts, it says, But the Spirit produces the fruit of love. And it produces the fruit of joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. It's the spirit that produces the fruit of these things in full measure. Okay, that's where, that's where it comes from. That there's something that's good, that's something that's reflecting this, uh, the fruit of the Spirit of God, this love, this joy, this peace, this patience, this kindness, this goodness, this faithfulness, and this, uh, you know, the gentleness and self-control. Well, it, it's of God's Spirit. It's of God's Spirit. And it may be in people, or it may be around people. But it's where we learn from it. It's where it's, it's empowered, where it really comes from. It says, verse 30, 24 in Galatians 5, those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified their own sil sinful selves. That's a sinful nature, the flesh. They have given up their old selfish feelings and the evil things they wanted to do. They get, uh, they get our new life from the Spirit. That's where, you know, that's where we get our new life from the Spirit. So we should follow, that is that we should be guided by, that we should walk in step with the Spirit, the Spirit of God. Verse 26, we must not be proud or conceited or make trouble with or provoke each other or be jealous or envious of each other. No, we, we can't. If we're walking in the Spirit, okay, you know, we, we, we've got to, you know, if, if, we, if we say we walk in the Spirit, we must live this way. It is a verb. It is an action. 
okay, before, you know, so that we can grow in our personalities, in the righteous personalities that God is creating in us, is it work Christ Jesus that's being recreated in us, that we can be able to say one day when the fullness of things have arrived that, yes, God is love and we are love. You know, that's where we're, that's what we want to go to. That's the maturity of where we're trying to go. Frome argued himself. He said that love isn't something natural. He recognized it wasn't natural and it wasn't common. Rather, he knew it required discipline, concentration, patience, faith. The overcoming of narcissism. Okay, here he's getting into his psychoanalyst stuff. Overcoming narcissism. He said, it isn't a feeling. He says, it's a practice. It's a practice. You know, Fromm had his own, you know, he just had to, to look at himself and what he could do because he wasn't looking to the one who gives his spirit that who is love. But nevertheless, he understood a lot because of his background in the scriptures. And in The Art of Loving, you know, Eric Fromm argues that the active character of true love involves, he says, there are four basic elements that he could discern. And he, 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 you know, he thought about this a lot. The four basic elements that are involved in the art of loving, and that's care, responsibility, respect, and knowledge. Those are four of the major areas, care, responsibility, respect, and knowledge. But Fromm knew and he believed that these elements don't come easily to human beings, that they're absent, in fact, from most human relationships. Most people, I think, he, he believed that they approach their relationships as a sort of a transaction. You do this for me and I do that for you. <laughs> you know, that's, how, that's how he looked at how most people approach things, very materialistically. You give me this and I get that, you know, this sort of thing. You know, drawing from his knowledge of the Torah, Eric Fromm used to, when he was talking about this, about the fact that, you know, that the art of loving didn't, uh, you know, didn't come easily to human beings. He would point to the story of Jonah to, to, to prove his point when he would do this. Do you know why? <laughs> what, what, what in there about Jonah was Eric, was Eric Fromm able to say, most people don't get the art of loving. <laughs> I mean, they, it's, they, you know, they don't get this care, responsibility, respect, and knowledge. They don't get it. Well, the basic point was Jonah, you know, he was given a job to do. He, God said to him, you know, one day he said, Jonah, I want you to go to the Assyrian Empire, these people who are enemies of your people, and go to the capital city, to Nineveh, and say to them, repent, <laughs> you know, God isn't happy with you. He's going to deal with you if you don't repent. But of course, you know, what did, what did Jonah do? He paid his fear, got in a boat going the opposite direction. You know the whole story. And of course, God said, mm -mm, you know, haul him back. You know, first of all, after a dunk, you know, <laughs> into the belly of the fish, and then get him vomited up on the land and said, okay, it's that way. <laughs> yeah, it's that way, Jonah. And Jonah, and Jonah, so Jonah goes over, you know, to Nineveh. You know, instead of going to over towards Spain, he had to go towards Nineveh. And he shows up in Nineveh and he does his job. Repent, you miserable, wicked, you know, Assyrian heathen scum. <laughs> he, he did all that. And, you know, the surprising thing was the king heard about it and the people heard about it. And they and somehow their conscience bothered them. And they did. They repented. And then what, was Jonah happy that the Assyrians repented? Was he happy, you know, that, you know, that, that seeing, you know, God's care, that God took responsibility, that, you know, was he happy in the knowledge of the nature of the God he was serving? Was he happy about that? Well, no, he wasn't happy at all. In fact, he was rather, he was very upset at this whole point. But at the very end, you know, the book of, of Jonah, you know, it ends with this in Jonah chapter 4 and verse 11. I'll read this in the Holman Christian Standard uh, Bible. 
God says to Jonah, you know, after Jonah had said, ah, you know, why did you do this? I knew you were going to do this and all this. He, he, see, he was missing the total point. And God said, should I not care about the great city of Nineveh, one of the great cities of the ancient world, which has more than 120,000 people, okay, not too many, not as many people in those days, who can't distinguish between their right hand and their left, okay, they're, you know, they're, you know, I haven't given them my covenant, you know, I've been working them with them for centuries, and as many animals, I mean, I'm, I'm you know, I'm concerned about all this life. I mean, I made them. They're in my image. I'm love. I'm concerned about these people. You should be too. <laughs> Jonah, shouldn't you? Why are you upset? Because I didn't fry them all. Well, Jonah shouldn't have been upset. He should have understood, you know, he should have understood the, the act of character of true love the act of character of the one he was serving as you know the, who as he said was his god he should have understood that let's go to luke chapter 6 and verse 27 see god was showing something which was in this particular case it was jesus christ who was working with jonah as i said earlier jesus christ is the god of the old covenant as the Apostle Paul put it, the rock that followed him uh, was Christ. The rock that followed the Israelites throughout the wilderness was Christ. Jesus is teacher and Lord. He is the Lord. He is the Yahweh, the Y-H-V-H. You know, that's, that's who he confessed who he was. Before Abraham was, I am, Jesus said. Okay, he made that great point. But anyways, the same one who spoke to Jonah said this later on, and he said this in the New Covenant Scriptures, and he teaches us, and he says this to us. Let's go to Luke chapter 6, verse 27. I'll read this in the New Living Translation. But to you who are willing to listen, Jesus says, I say love, agapao, your enemies. I say to you who are willing to listen, love your enemies. Love your enemies. Love, agapao, this is discriminating affection that involves the choice and selection, embracing God's will, choosing what he chooses, obeying them through his power. To those who you are willing to listen, love your enemies. Continuing on, do good to those who hate you. Bless those who curse you. Pray for those who hurt you. If someone slaps you on one cheek, offer the other cheek also. If someone demands your coat, offer your shirt also. Give to anyone who asks, and when things are taken away from you, don't try to get them back. Do to others as you would like them to do to you. If you love only those who love you, why should you get credit for that? Even sinners love those who love them. And if you do good only to those who do good to you, why should you get any credit? Even sinners do that much. And if you lend money only to those who can repay, repay you, why should you get credit? Even sinners will lend to other sinners for a full return. Verse 35, love your enemies. Do good to them. Lend to them without expecting to be repaid. Then your reward from heaven will be very great, and you will truly be acting as children of the Most High, for he is kind to those who are unthankful, people like the Assyrians, and wicked. You must be compassionate just as your Father is compassionate. Because love isn't just a feeling. It's something that we practice. It's something we're practicing and we're doing these things in order to master, and to, in order to be loved, to have it formed fully within us. We must practice these things. And sometimes we do it in, in the context of we don't get much, you know, we don't get much feedback, of necessarily always what we would like. For Fromm, love is not primarily a relationship even to a specific person. It's an attitude. 
he calls it an ordination of character. <laughs> an ordination of character. In other words, how you, we're ordering our character, which determines the relatedness of the person to the whole world. It's how we relate to everything not toward one object of love. So it's not specific, you know, relationships just to one person. It's how we're relating to the everyone, to everything we're doing. Are we doing it in love? If a person loves only one other person and is indifferent to all others, Fromm said, his love is not love but a symbiotic attachment or an enlarged egoism. He's, he makes this point, you know, about a lot of couples. He, he calls it even, uh, the, he uses the French phrase, egoisme, adieu, you know, that, you know, they just love each other. They don't really care about anybody else. That's not the point. They're missing the point. That's, love is not that sort of relationship. That's, what he's, that's not, what it's, that's not what, it, what it's getting to be. He's, he argues that love is a decision. It is a judgment. It is a promise. He's saying, if love were only a feeling, there would be no basis for the promise to love each other forever. A feeling comes and may go. How can I judge that it will stay forever when my act does not involve judgment and decision? So he's saying very clearly that, you know, when we make, this is why he says it's a decision. We decide we're going to do things. We decide to take on the responsibilities. He's saying it's a decision, it's a judgment, and it's a promise. It's a promise. It's not a feeling because feelings do come and go. He thinks, so in, in looking at the relationship of God to man, he, and he takes his idea of this for how he sees how God relates to man. He says, God gives man of that which is alive in him. In other words, everything we have in alive that's, that we're experiencing, God has created this in us. He gives us of his joy, of his interest, of his understanding, of his knowledge, of his humor, of his sadness. All expressions and manifestations of that which is alive in us. And thus giving of his life, God's life, he enriches the other person. He enriches the other. He enriches humanity. He enhances the other's sense of aliveness. Okay, he enhances humanity's even comprehension that we are sentient beings. And in doing this, Fromm thinks that he enhances his own sense of aliveness. That's, you know, this is a God is love. He shows love. He pours it out on us. And it's the amazing thing is, is that some return it. Some return it. He, but he doesn't give in order to receive. It's just like we, we live by grace. We're first forgiven. When, 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 you know, when, you know he, he shows us his grace to call us to repentance and opens the door for us. When we're not, you know, of anything we've done, we don't merit it or worthy of, worthy of it. He doesn't give in order to receive. Giving is itself an exquisite joy. It's certainly that is for God. You know, and God loves a cheerful giver because we're, and it, you know, we're emulating him. It, it, giving of itself is an exquisite joy, but in giving he cannot help bringing something to life in the other person. When we give to another person, that actually opens a door and, and, and allows us to actually perhaps preach, <laughs> to preach love, to preach what we want when we give it. It, it gives us a chance to do that. It brings something to life, he says, in the other person. And that which is brought to life can be reflected back to the giver. You know, this is, this is, this is the promise. This is the hope. This is what God is saying when he's saying to love your enemies, to love your neighbor as yourself. That in giving, you know, it, it, it's, you're bringing something into the life of this other person person, something good, and, you know, and there is this hope that it will reflect back to you, just as God has given us salvation.
He's given us the promise of salvation, and this is going to reflect back in the love, okay, that we will show to him. It's a very important, it's a very interesting concept of, of, of why we give. What is the good point in that? Let's go now to 1 John. I mentioned here this just a little earlier that God is love. Let's see what, he's, what the Apostle John was saying in this section here. In the epistles of the Apostle John, that's 1 John chapter 4 and verse, I want to start with verse 7. Apostle John said this to the church. He said this to the church. Beloved, we should love one another because love is from God. And everyone who loves has been begotten by God and knows God. The one who does not love does not know God because God is love. In this way, the love of God was manifested towards us that God sent his only begotten Son into the world so that we might live through him. In this act is the love. Not that we love God, rather that he loved us and sent his Son to be the propitiation for our sins. The propitiation, the stand-in, the payment for our sins. Beloved, if God so loved us, if God so loved us, we also are duty-bound to love one another. Let's drop down here to verse 16. And we have known and have believed the love that God has towards us. God is love. And the one who dwells in love is dwelling in God and God in him. This is a very important point. God is love, and the one who dwells in love, who is practicing love, okay, who is doing these, he's trying, he's working at mastering this love, he's in, in practicing it. Well, this is the one that has love dwelling in him. We, we're dwelling in God. We're going to dwell in God. This is what he's saying. We have known and have believed the love that God has towards us. God is love. The one who dwells in love is dwelling in God and God in him. By this spiritual indwelling, the love of God is perfected within us. The, this mastery of being, you know, as it were, a lover <laughs> is being perfected within us by this spiritual indwelling of the presence of his Holy Spirit so that we may have confidence in the day of judgment, because even as he is, so also are we in this world. We're reflecting him. We are reflecting him. We're serving him in this way. We're choosing those things that, are, that, that he prefers. We have this love and we're, we're, we're demonstrating it to others. We're giving it so it's going to also possibly reflect back to him. Very important concept. Verse 18, there is no fear in the love of God. Rather, perfect love casts out fear because fear has torment. You know, last week I was talking about fear from this aspect. Many people have the fear of intimacy. Well, there is no fear in the love of God. Perfect love casts out fear. It casts it out because fear has torment. And the one who fears has not been made perfect in the love of God. We love him because he loved us first. Okay. We only come to love God because he loved us first. We didn't work it up all of our own. I mean, if, not to our credit. We can't pat ourselves on the back. I love God, you know, I'm so good. No, he loved us, and we begin to reflect it back to him. If anyone says, I love God, and hates his brother, he is a liar. And if he does not love his brother whom he has seen, how is he able to love God whom he has not seen? This is critically important scripture for the church of God. Really. 
It really is. Anyone who says they are Christian, if we say we love God and hate our brethren in the church, this is a major problem, God is saying. You're a liar. You really are. You're a liar. You're a hypocrite. For if he does not love his brother whom he has seen, how is he able to love God whom he has not seen? And this is the commandment that we have for, from him, that the one who loves God should also love his brother. And in this case, we're not, you know, talking necessarily, you know, you know this, is, this is a spiritual brother or sister from that standpoint. The people that who are in a, you know, with, whom, with whom we are in fellowship. The New Covenant scriptures insist that we lived harmoniously with each other because this is what, how he wants us to live with him. Doesn't that make sense? God wants us to live harmoniously with each other because after all, he's offering us eternal life. And he knows what the deal is. <laughs> In eternal life, he wants people that he can live harmoniously with, too. So we have to practice. We have to learn the mastery of loving each other, of showing love from this standpoint. It's very important that we, we do this, and he expects us to do this. So if we go to Romans chapter 12 and verse 10, I'll read this in the New Living Translation. Apostle Paul said this. He said to the, to the brethren, to the church, he said, love each other with genuine affection. That's brotherly love. That's Philadelphia. Love each other with genuine affection and take delight in honoring each other. Whatever it is, uh, how we can show honor and preference and, and lift up and encourage. Take delight in it, he says. In the, the same verse of Romans 12, 10 in the expanded, it says, love, it, it says, love each other or be devoted to each other like brothers and sisters with family brotherly affection. Give each other more honor than you want for yourselves. Or outdo one another in showing honor. Or be eager to show honor to one another. How would the church of God change? <laughs> if, you know, you just think about it, if this was the attitude. We need to be able to do this. This is something we must practice, we must grow in. Finally, we'll conclude with this. Let's go to 2 Corinthians chapter 13 and verse 11. 2 Corinthians 13 and verse 11. And again, an expanded version. Apostle Paul wrote and admonished the church. He said, Now, brothers and sisters, I say be joyful. Rejoice. Live in harmony. Live in harmony, the way the expanded puts it. That is to seek restitution or mend your ways. Live in harmony. He says, do what I've asked you to do now. Agree with each other. That's live in unity. Get along and live in peace. Live in peace, living in the condition of God's peace. Live in peace, living, that's living in the condition of God's peace. And then he says, if you do this, what's the promise? Then the God of love and peace will be with you. It's quite the promise. If we do these things, if we actually live this way, if we go about mastering the art of loving in our lives, practicing it, then the God of love and peace will truly will be with you.